Hello, I'm Christina Greer. Welcome to the special program about the ongoing battle within the Democratic Party as crucial midterm elections approach. In the coming hour, we'll break down the current struggle for control among Democrats and explore the best path forward for progressives en route to the polls in November. We'll talk with Amy Allison, president of Democracy in Color, a media organization dedicated to race, politics, and the new American majority. Jim Zogby, founder and president of the Arab American Institute, and until recently, a member of the executive committee of the Democratic National Committee. Zephyr Teachout, former candidate for Congress and the Democratic nominee for governor of New York. And Dan Cantor, national chair of the Working Families Party, a grassroots progressive party fighting for economic, environmental, and racial justice. This joint production of Free Speech TV and the Manhattan Neighborhood Network is coming to you from El Barrio Firehouse Studio in East Harlem, New York. Before hearing from our guests, we'd like to take a few minutes to bring you up to speed on what's now at issue for progressives as we head into the November elections. Can the continuing conflict within the Democratic Party be resolved? And what might be the best policies for progressives to push for in the run-up to the midterms? Mr. Speaker! Donald Trump's unexpected election upended American politics and put Republicans firmly in charge. We must act decisively to protect all Americans. Democrats were left in disarray. A battle is now underway for control, perhaps even for the soul of the party, as progressives push for what their leader Bernie Sanders called for throughout his presidential campaign, a full-scale political revolution. What this campaign is about is creating a political revolution in America. Facing crucial midterm elections, Democrats seem poised to win back the House, perhaps even the Senate. Polls show most voters now prefer Democrats by a wide margin. I definitely think that this is going to be a wave election. Mark Winston Griffith was a Sanders delegate in 2016. People's antipathy, their, their disgust with Trump and his administration is going to get people out the door. It definitely feels like there's a wave growing. Dan Cantor heads the Working Families Party. Whether it will crest at the right time, we can't know ahead of time. But uh, I'd rather be us than them at this moment. I definitely see the wave beginning to form. Jane Klebb is Nebraska Democratic Party chair. Democrats have been winning in untraditional places. And so we are competing everywhere, which I think is like step number one for Democrats. The other reason why I think a wave is happening is just how disastrous Trump is. Like you cannot remove him from the equation. But the party's internal wounds have yet to heal. Progressives say they have been purged from crucial posts at the Democratic National Committee. These were people who had either supported Bernie Sanders for president or supported Keith Ellison for DNC chair or both. The message is that we're going to get rid of people who may have dissenting opinions or may be calling for different kinds of reform or, or retaliating for positions that they've taken. This is not the direction that the Democratic Party should be going in. So we are Democrats, and if there wasn't a little bit of drama in the family, we'd be the Republican Party, maybe. Uh, so we like drama. The drama played out recently at a meeting of the Unity Reform Commission, created to ensure a more transparent and inclusive presidential nomination process in 2020. Protesters caused what Kleb calls a kerfuffle. Activists say the party's base is progressive, but its power brokers are not. You will find, just like we did just recently with the DNC um, meeting, the party at least has to give lip service and acknowledgement to the barbarians at the gate, so to speak, and the people that are pushing. Karen Bernal chairs the California Democratic Party's Progressive Caucus. She co-authored this recent Autopsy on the Democratic Party in Crisis, its conclusion. Siding with the people who constitute the base isn't truly possible when party leaders seem to be afraid of them. Only massive pressure from the grassroots will be able to sustain momentum towards a democratic, democratic party. I think we need to make it clear that we want to change 
and that change has to come even if we have to fight members of the Democratic Party. These kinds of progressive changes won't happen unless we are there making the push. The forces that gathered around Sanders, Senator Sanders and his run, these are the ascendant forces inside the Democratic Party. That's where the Working Families Party locates itself. That's where Indivisible and Move On and Color of Change and Democracy in Color, that's where we all locate ourselves. We're trying to yank and pull and prod the Democrats in a better direction. Sometimes activist crit criticism of the party's right and sometimes it's wrong, but I'm always on the favor of let's listen to those voices and see what we can do to bring those people back into the party. Unity doesn't mean unanimity. We may not agree on everything, but when we recognize that what unites us far exceeds what our differences are, that's when we're at our best. I'm a progressive, but I think it would be a mistake to say we need to go full tilt progressive and not give a damn about what people in the middle are feeling. I don't care who you supported in the presidential election, whether it was Hillary or Bernie or somebody else. The point here is about strengthening our democracy and coming together to enact real reforms that will actually do that in a real way. I think the time for uh, kind of pointing fingers and infighting and bickering is long past. The Democratic Party can lead the country in a new direction. The ongoing struggle over party politics is important, but so too are policies. What do Democrats stand for? Former Labor Secretary Robert Reich. Millions of Americans who are politically engaged for the first time in their lives are crying out for a bold alternative to bigoted and destructive policies. But Democrats can't just be anti-Trump or move to the middle. To be successful, Democrats must address the forces that created Trump, widening inequality of income, of wealth, economic insecurity, and of political power. If Democrats stand for one thing, it must be overcoming this unprecedented imbalance. For Democrats to win in November, they must unite behind a positive message of inclusion and issues with broad appeal. Reich suggests we start with six. One, public investment in world-class schools and infrastructure. Two, free public universities and first-class technical training. Three, single-payer Medicare for all. Four, higher taxes on the wealthy to pay for this. Number five, using antitrust to break up powerful monopolies on Wall Street, big tech, big pharma, and big agriculture. And number six, getting big money out of our politics. Such steps could be the beginning of an agenda to reclaim our economy and democracy. But first, the struggle for the party's soul must be resolved. Now's the time for us all to stand up and raise our voices and say, this is the kind of democracy that we want and actually fight for those changes to make it happen. Will the Democrats, can the Democrats lead the way? Jim Zogby has long been active in U.S. politics from his early efforts in the 80s as senior advisor to Jesse Jackson's presidential campaigns to his work on the executive committee of the Democratic National Committee beginning in 2001. Welcome Jim Zogby. Thank, Thank you. you so much for coming. So let's get right to it. What happened in 2016, and is there a purge of the progressives from the Democratic Party? What happened in 2016 is we nominated a candidate who simply was not trusted, um, not only by progressives, but by working people across the country. Secretary Clinton has a great record. She's done marvelous things in her life. She simply was not trusted. She got more votes, mm -hmm. but she didn't carry Wisconsin, Michigan, states that that Democrats should never lose because they're states of working people, lost Ohio, et cetera. And we've been losing those states now uh, for too many years. And so we have been pushing within the party to broaden what we define as our base vote in the party. As long as the party simply focuses on a few target groups, what they call the Obama coalition, and thinks that that will be the path forward, we will never be a majoritarian party. Yes, we should support and encourage efforts to increase African-American voter registration, Latino voter registration, millennial voter registration, professional women, et cetera. But we can't let white working class people go. And that, I think, was the, 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 the tragedy of 2016. And I think that the party still has not learned that lesson. Those of us who've been pushing uh, for a broader base in the party mm -hmm. uh, supported Keith Ellison. 
Uh, Keith Ellison ran for party chair against Tom Perez, um, but there were a lot of folks who were out to get Keith, everything from the Muslim bit to the pro-Palestinian bit, uh, to the fact that they simply didn't want an anti-establishment Democrat mm -hmm. running the party. Um, Perez won. Um, it was a very tough and close election. Our feeling was, coming out of that election, was the time to heal wounds and unify the party. Tom Perez chose to deepen the wound and divide the party by purging a lot of Keith Ellison supporters from the executive committee and from a lot of the major committees, like Rules and Bylaws right. Committee, uh, and put in people that were supportive of his position, and that is the, the Hillary Clinton establishment position. I think it was a mistake. I, I believe in the old Jesse Jackson philosophy, it takes two wings to fly. Mm. And what you got is, right now, one wing struggling to try to make a flight out of it. And I think it's, 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 it's a problem. I think the party has to come together. And one of the ways to come together is to bring the Bernie and Keith Ellison people in to leadership alongside of the Clinton people. Is it possible to bring them back in since they, it seems as though they've been purged out? Well, the way you do it is the way Pat Robertson did it in the 80s. You go around from state to state and you take over the parties. But look, within two years' time, he had control of 17 state Republican parties. And the religious right till this day is the dominant group in the, in the Republican Party. When we started our revolution, the goal was work state by state by state to take over the Democratic Party so that we become the DNC. We mm -hmm. become the leadership of the party around the country. And if it won't happen easily by the chair simply bringing people together, we'll do it on our own hmm. from the bottom up. From the bottom up. So talk to us a little bit more about the Unity Reform Commission within. Well, one of the conditions that Bernie had when he, appoint, when he, when he uh, agreed to endorse Secretary uh, Clinton was that there a number of issues had to be dealt, dealt with. Caucuses had to be strengthened. Primaries had to be transformed so that they become more open, become more inclusive, and provide greater opportunity for, for Democrats and independents to participate. 41% of the electorate today is independent. Most young uh, voters, most African American voters are independent. To rule them out simply makes no sense. Mm -hmm. So that was a one part of it. Then there was uh, an issue of superdelegates and what to do about that. You can't start the primary process off by having CNN say, uh, and Secretary Clinton has 400 votes already before you even cast one. Uh, and then the fourth area was changing the Democratic Party, making it more democratic, more transparent, more accountable. Um, we met. Now, the Clinton people kept calling it the Unity Commission, but we kept insisting that it was, as it was set out to be, the Unity and Reform Commission, because our goal was to reform the party so that we could better unify. Okay. To have a chair who is unaccountable, to have a budgetary process that is totally non-transparent. I've been on the DNC for 25 years, and 16 of them on the executive committee have never seen a party budget, even though the bylaws mandate mm -hmm. that we should not only see the budget, but we should discuss and vote on the effectiveness of it. People don't know where the party is spending money. And actually, to be a member of the Democratic Party today basically means I'm on a call list that says send me money, or I'm on an email list that says send me, send me money. What does membership mean? You don't vote for anything except in an election. You don't vote for party leadership within the party. So we wanted to make the party democratic. We wanted to make it accountable. We wanted to make it transparent. And so we had proposals. We actually won on a number of fronts. And now this issue goes to the Rules and Bylaws Committee. Is that where we are right We're now? We're at the Rules and Bylaws Committee. The problem is the Rules and Bylaws Committee is appointed by the chair. <laughs> and they have decided they want to reopen and rediscuss all these issues. Can't do it. If there's going to be unity, they have to accept the compromise we already, you shouldn't get a second bite out of the apple because you didn't get everything you wanted because there are Hillary Clinton on the Rules and Bylaws Committee, Hillary Clinton people, but there are no Bernie Sanders people on Rules and Bylaws. See, you can't get unity when only one side's actually in the When in the there's discussion. only one wing flying the plane. So I think we'll actually, I think we'll actually be able to put enough pressure but I think on the floor of the DNC, where it goes next, uh, I hope that people will be wise enough to say we should pass what was done because that's the way forward to unity and a stronger party. So what does 2018 November look like for us? What does 2020 look like for progressives in the DNC? I think in terms of the party, 2020 plays a more important role. 20, 
Uh, 2018 is going to be a function of the candidates who run mm -hmm. and whether or not they are compelling, whether they're authentic, whether they have a message that actually reaches to a broad base. Trump is doing everything he can to help us. Unfortunately, we're not doing enough to help ourselves. I mean, I think what happened with the, um, with the budget um, sent a very confusing message, not just to progressives, not just to Latinos, not just to people concerned about immigration, but to Americans in general. I mean, people know Donald Trump is a disaster. Um, we should be doing more to send a consistent, progressive message of what change looks like mm -hmm. and fighting for that change. Uh, th there's a saying we have in Washington, Republicans are carnivores and Democrats are vegans. They <laughs> eat their young. And we sit by and say, well, maybe we ought to really have a better way to do this. Mm. Bullshit. We need to fight <laughs> for what's right because that can win. Right. Now, look. I always thought it was Democrats will snatch the, <laughs> the, jo the feet the out of the jaws, jaws of, of victory. victory. Right. W w that too. Uh, <laughs> the issue here is that I, I think from what I've seen, we got some good people running and we've got some really horrific Republicans out there who are know they're horrific and are actually mm -hmm. seeing the writing on the wall and are dropping like flies. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think the House is, is doable. I'm not sure the Senate is, okay. but in any case, I think that we're going to put a scare into them. And I, I, I hope, look, if we come out of it with the House in 2018, then I'm all set for impeaching Trump and Pence and bringing Nancy Pelosi in as, as, uh, mm -hmm. uh, as, as the first female president of the United States of America. Everything will change if we control the House of Representatives. Everything will change. Hmm. Because the things that Donald Trump can do and get away with, he will not be able to do. My fear is we win the House and then we get cowardly because we start thinking about 2020, just like we did with George Bush. Yep. Instead of impeaching, instead of going after him because of torture, be going after him for lying about the war, we gave him a ride because we said, well, you know, we have to really worry about winning the election in 2000, blah, blah, blah. We lost that election, and, and, and I mean, sorry, we won that election, but we never got people held accountable for the crimes they committed. Uh -huh. We should actually, if we win the House, we should put heat on the House right. to go after Donald Trump and his cohorts to make sure that, that they pay for the crimes they committed against the American people. Well, we shall see what happens in 2018. No, that? I'm telling you more. Uh, we shall see what happens in November 2018 and, God willing, in 2020 if we're here. So thank you so much, Jim Bogby. Thank you. Uh, looking forward to more. In a moment, we'll be joined by Zephyr Teachout, who mounted a primary challenge to New York Governor Andrew Cuomo not too long ago, and Dan Cantor, National Chair of the Working Families Party. I'm Christina Greer, and you're watching our Free Speech TV and MNN production. Welcome back. I'd like to begin by asking Zephyr Teachout to share what she learned while challenging a powerful Democratic incumbent in 2014 and what those lessons might mean for other progressive candidates in November. Zephyr, I'll start with you. So you took on an incumbent Democratic governor, relatively popular at the time, um, and you did incredibly well, uh, much to the surprise of Governor Cuomo. Tell us what that was like and where do you think the movement can go from your real success in 2014? Yeah, I think uh, one of the things that we saw in that race, and then we've seen even more in the last few years, is that there's an unbelievable untapped energy for real progressive leadership. And uh, although I was running against Andrew Cuomo, a lot of the campaign was also about what we could do, how we could ban fracking, how we could fully fund education. And there was this incredible hunger for actually building green infrastructure, for really investing. So it wasn't just an anti. One of the things I felt during that campaign is that basically after the crash of 2008, the public changed mm. and politicians didn't catch up. After 2008, people are looking <coughs> around and saying, my life wasn't getting better for a long time. And now the big banks have crashed the economy. Um, something fundamental has to change in the way we approach this. But 2010, 2012, a lot of Democrats just acted like business as usual, everything's mm -hmm. the same, nothing, you know, the world, there was a huge earthquake, there was Sandy and mm -hmm. the crash, but we're not gonna act like anything changed. Mm -hmm. But things changed in people's own understanding of the world. They saw that big corporations were really buying uh, power within the party 
uh, within the parties, and they wanted a different, more positive future. And you came in and, and made that inroad. Well, we had a three-month campaign and ended up getting 34% of the vote. Mm -hmm. um, and really based on grassroots energy. You know, people coming forward and stepping mm -hmm. up to not just be donors or answering poll questions, but to be organizing themselves. Right. And so, Dan, you and the Working Families Party have somewhat of a unique insider-outsider space in relation to the dominant Democratic Party in New York, in the sense that in some ways you work with the party, and mm -hmm. other times you all sort of serve as the adversary to the party. Can you walk us through a little bit more about some of your strategies that you have employed in a progressive moment, but also what you think you all are going to do moving forward? Sure. Um, so we live in a two-party system, by and large, because of the winner-take-all, first-past-post the system, first-past-the-post system. So the WP is understood as both an independent third party and a faction of the Democratic Party at the same time, and it's complicated. So we like to support progressive populist challengers to corporate Democrats, uh, to coin a term. Um, that, I think, is on the way out, hopefully. Uh, but we also very occasionally will run a standalone candidate uh, but that's pretty rare. In general, what we're trying to do is yank and pull and prod the Democrats in the direction that Zim Jim Zogby was talking about earlier, in the direction that Zephyr represented in that race. Uh, we did not support Zephyr in her race uh, uh, in 2014. Uh, controversial, interesting uh, decision at the time. But there's no question that uh, her race is what then produced much of the progressive changes that happened in the state. Uh, not, uh, not because of Governor Cuomo, but because of Zephyr's challenge. So you can sometimes challenge and not win and still have incredible, incredible mm -hmm. impact. This year, 2018, feels like a moment when the tide is really shifted. This incredible energy that's out there, there's four or 500 state legislative seats across America mm -hmm. that we are trying to recruit teach out style people to run so that if there's a wave that washes Democrats ashore, it washes ashore Democrats who are a working family style Democrat, mm -hmm. a Zogby, an our revolution style Democrat. Mm -hmm that will well, govern. I like the Zogby stuff. The Zogby <laughs> style <laughs> Democrat, right. So You heard it here first. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so it's not mysterious. Politics is not mysterious. It's right. hard. It's a yeah. tremendous amount of work. Uh, you have to say the same thing over and over <laughs> and over again. Uh, but that's what organizing is. And what's different at this moment that's so exciting is that our side is actually winning this fight about the future of the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. uh, we're changing the center of gravity. Uh, and that doesn't mean you win this fight once and forever. It's going to happen over mm -hmm. and over again. Uh, we didn't go away over this long, these long years in the desert when the DLC with the Democratic leadership was in charge. Uh, the corporate and the Wall Street wing of the party, they're not going to go away. But it feels like if we're smart, uh, we will end up being the dominant force, and that will be mm -hmm. good for the party and good for America. Jim, what are your thoughts on, on that strategy? I, I was thinking, while you were speaking of um, Jack O'Dell, Oh, yeah. who uh, we worked with in the Jackson campaign. And I remember one time Jack said to me, I, I came away with a little victory that I won. And he said, uh, don't rest on your laurels. He said, just when you think you won, the long knives come out. Mm -hmm. Always be ready for the next round. Mm -hmm. um, there's no such thing as defeat. There's no such thing as victory. There's just constant struggle moving forward. And, um, and another thing I was thinking of about you know, when you lose, there, you know, th there's a sense, and we're hearing it now with a lot of folks, especially after the Senate made the deal, et cetera. People are just you know, playing a damn exit game. And um, Jesse Jackson said to me one time, when I was frustrated about an issue that involved exclusion of Arabs and I wanted to just quit, he said, don't quit. Because if you quit, you give them just what they want. Mm -hmm. What they're most afraid of is that you stay around and fight. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the lesson for progressives in the Democratic Party, is that if we walk away, um, they win. If we stay and fight, then we have the chance of defeating them. And I think ultimately we will, because all the currents are moving in our direction. The question is, do we have the energy and the capacity to organize those currents and, and move them to victory? I think that we have a better chance than than I would have thought a few years back, yeah. thanks to, I think, a lot of things that have been helping, including Donald Trump. Right. Um, but no help from the party itself. And that's the issue that bothers me, is that the Democratic Party could be a force of energy in this, but they're actually not. They're going to be a bystander to this change. It's going to come from progressives and from progressive organizations like Working Family Party, like DSA, like Our Revolution, like groups on the progressive side who are going to are the ones who are going to have to push this thing forward. So Zephyr, I mean, you've now had four years away from this. Cuomo is up for re-election. 
Um, what do you think, you know, as someone who was in the middle of the storm, you know, what do you think needs to happen to make sure this blue typhoon comes, not just over the state of New York, but over the country? Um, well, uh, organize, organize, organize is one part of it. So one part is just there's no shortcut to the actual work. Mm -hmm. Like, the uh, big risk is that all the newly engaged people in politics become pundits. <laughs> Um, and just spend their time discussing and dissecting what happened instead of just doing the work. Mm -hmm. So that's one half. And the other half is that organizing is around actually taking on um, our corporate overlords, but in a serious way, mm -hmm. is sort of coming together from uh, and saying, recognizing where the real threats are to people's health, mm -hmm. uh, to people's health care, uh, to clean water, to why we can't have decent jobs, recognizing that the deep, deep threat is not just the Republican Party, it's uh, real estate big money, it's hedge fund money, it's big monopoly money, and uh, we, uh, that, we as Democrats, in an old Democratic tradition, not the 80s, 90s corporate Democrat tradition, but in, a, in the old Democratic tradition, our job is to stand up against these middlemen that are extracting value from people's lives and to fight for people across the board. So it's both about the work and about the content of the work. Uh, look, there, there might be end up being a blue wave uh, even if it's a, a bunch of uh, corporate Democrats. Um, I think that's a lot less likely. Uh, I think it's a lot more likely that people are gonna come out and do the work because they actually believe this is a war worth fighting, not just for partisan reasons, but because of the material impacts it's gonna make in people's lives. Dan, <coughs> you know, we have about one minute left. What, what should we be thinking about in the next few months or the next few years as far as progressive politics, not just in New York, but across the country? Sure. Uh, Okay, in one minute. So this is a <laughs> wonderful, terrible country at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, Tell me about it. <laughs> full of enormous <laughs> promise, enormously wonderful people, funny people, smart people, and yet a system that seems to uh, expect the worst and try to make that happen. It's really awful. So uh, for this next seven or eight months, uh, the number one thing to do is what uh, Jim was saying earlier. We have to take back at least one House of Congress. Mm -hmm. uh, there is no alternative. So we should fight like crazy to get progressives to be the candidates for the Democrats. And if we fail, we should still support them. And we should, hopefully, we'll be supporting more of ours than, than not. I'm optimistic about that. But regardless, we want to bring a halt to this monstrosity, the buffoonery of the, of the Trump administration. That's job one. Longer term, we have to do all of the kind of intellectual and organizing work that Zephyr was just talking about that totally transforms the limits of the possible. We can use the government to improve people's lives, but also, uh, give people their own ability and their own agency to, to do it for themselves by organizing. Wow. Well, thank you all so much thank for you. joining us. Uh, thank you all. Uh, in a moment, I'll be joined by Amy Allison, president of Democracy in Color. I'm Christina Greer. Please stay with us. Welcome back, and welcome Amy Allison, president of Democracy in Color, a media organization dedicated to race, politics, and the new American majority. I'd like to begin by asking what you mean by the new American majority and what that majority might mean to the Democratic Party. Welcome, Amy. Thanks. I'm so happy to be here. So tell us, what is the new American majority? Despite the fact that Republicans control the Congress, the Senate, and the majority of state houses, we have an electoral majority. It's a progressive multiracial majority. We call the new American majority. The way that we figured it out, and this was really laid out in Steve Phillips' book, Brown is a New White, is based on the numbers of who re-elected Barack Obama, we see that the Democratic Party that's half people of color, if we look at the fact that within the grouping of people of color, the majority of them will vote for progressives or Democrats, mm -hmm. and then about 28% of white voters, will vote for Democrats, and together that forms about to 51%. So that's the majority. So why do we keep losing? Mm -hmm. And the whole point is that both the Democratic Party donors, funders, the whole ecosystem of strategists don't understand that a multiracial uh, coalition can win, can win back Congress, can win state houses, can win governorships, mm -hmm. if they focus on the voters who are most loyal. So we saw a couple of weeks before Christmas in a special uh, Senate election in Alabama, black women 
in an independent effort, were spoken to, were engaged, they were uh, 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 really through a network. They came out at 98% for the Democrat. So 7% of the population in a state that hasn't been controlled by Democrats in a long time were able to win that Senate seat. And that shows the power of taking the most loyal, staunch progressives and um, investing in them, elevating them, and they can win. We can do the Alabama style strategy in Georgia, we can do it in Florida, we can do it in, um, in uh, Nevada, we can do it Wisconsin. in Texas, we can right. do it across the country, but it requires Democrats to see and to invest in voters of color who are most likely to turn out to the polls for to, to help elevate uh, progressive champions across the country. So in a previous segment, our guest Jim Zogby said, you know, essentially progressives and the Democratic Party need to focus on, you know, the disaffected white male voter who's essentially left maybe temporarily or permanently, we're not sure, but we need to go back and, and get that white male Democratic voter back because we're speaking to his issues. What would you say to that particular strategy for Democrats and sort of progressive Democrats who want to go down that road? It's an old playbook. It doesn't work. Uh, strategists who focus on uh, spending money on uh, and focusing on um, moderate white voters and, to, and ignore voters of color do it at their own detriment. Um, and we see even Doug Jones' case in Alabama where the campaign itself spent seven of nine million dollars on TV and digital ads aimed at the white swing voter. It wasn't white voters alone that put Doug Jones into office. We saw it was black women's high vote turnout that uh, secured the victory. This is an old way of Democrats planning uh, uh, victory, but it doesn't work, it doesn't really reflect the new winning strategy. So what I would say is there's always been a meaningful minority of white voters who are in the new American majority and that, um, they're all, that are willing to vote for progressive candidates. Uh, but in a, m across the board for both white men and white women voters, they are not considered the staunchest progressives and the core of the Democratic Party. And so I think m what's much better in terms of investing in dollars, investing in strategy, elevating voters, is to look at and um, spend money on ground operations, what we call C4 operations, where they're actually knocking on doors and talking to voters um, in a new way. Mm -hmm. And that means that the old Democratic strategist playbook says, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna aim for white uh, moderate voters, we're gonna try to convince people, maybe even people who voted for Trump. But what I'm saying is, if you have an on the ground operation where you engage early, not the last six weeks before the election, mm -hmm. the, real, uh, uh, the real way that we need to convince voters of color to come out is to talk early and often to them. And you see a candidacy of Stacey Abrams, who's running for governor of Georgia, running a brand new type of campaign that's talking to voters. Now you look at Georgia, um, Trump won Georgia, mm -hmm. and Democrats statewide, uh, typically there's a, a vote gap of about 200, 230,000. But there's a 1.2 million unregistered voters of color in that state. So Georgia's about to turn majority people of color, and there's this huge opportunity to turn the state blue by having a focused, engaged program to register and talk to voters of color. Mm -hmm. Stacey Abrams is doing that. That's what I believe the new formula uh, for Democrats to win in the South and in places that are currently controlled by Republicans. So I've been following that race very closely just because, you know, based on Stacey Abrams' qualifications, it's very plausible that she could be the the first black female governor in the well, history of the United States. She was a House Minority Leader. She's already she, a tested and exact. proven leader. So why is it that the Democratic Party um, doesn't seem to, I always say, love the one they're with, right? Black women as voters, black women as candidates. Why does there seem to be a little bit of an information gap? Uh, Jason Johnson of The Root once said that black women are the kryptonite to the Republican Party. Why is it that the Democratic Party doesn't see black female voters and black female candidates as the future of the party and the backbone of the party? You know, it was the first time after Alabama that I saw national recognition, remember the hashtag, thank black women. Mm -hmm. And I'm one of those who say, don't thank us, elevate <laughs> us, follow us. Because mm -hmm. if you had followed black women as, as voters, since black women have had regular access to the polls in 65 after the Voting Rights Act, 
black women have been the highest vote turnout of any race and gender, mm -hmm. and the staunchest progressives. So when we look at that uh, and ask why the Democratic Party is not investing in, and in fact, the state Democratic Party in Georgia put in a moderate white uh, Democrat, and black women and women of color are the most primaried group of candidates. Oh, okay. They're most likely to face a challenge from people in their own party, which makes it difficult, mm -hmm. uh, another barrier uh, for it's black money. women. It's yeah, a lot it's of It's about, about money, mm -hmm. and it's about uh, uh, validity, and you know who, who looks like a leader, mm -hmm. and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I really, it does come down to racism. I, I wanna say something, because on the progressive side, there's a sense of, uh, you know, we don't talk about racism, we think we're better than that, and we point the finger over at Trump or the Republicans. Um, but there were only 15 Senate Democrats who um, told the line in the budget agreement that did not include um, some solution to prevent 900,000 DACA recipients from being deported. Every single Senate Democrat who voted for that budget voted in essence to say it's okay to, to um, uh, deport uh, young people who are fellow citizens but for a set of papers that we'd made a promise to as a country. Mm -hmm. It's immoral. Mm -hmm. And so for me, um, we hold, we need to talk about the role of racism, we need to talk about the blindness, um, both on the Democratic and the Republican side. Because I tell you, the most exciting and the most amazing movements that are changing our country, the, the, the hope, I just spoke at the San Francisco Women's March, uh, we have the Black Lives Matters, we have the DACA struggle, those are women of color that are standing up and holding a moral standard and calling the country into consciousness, consciousness and saying, we can be better, we believe in this country. And so those are the kind of leaders that we need and the blindness and the racism that we see that prevents uh, people who you know, run campaigns and select leaders the old style or who uh, justify a vote uh, that damages and, 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 and puts all these DACA recipients at risk. We do not need those kind of leaders. It's time for change. Mm -hmm. So if you look at change and the courage, really, you're going to have to look at black women and, and women of color for that. So if, if we could sort of give one, one sort of big lesson to the progressive wing of the Democratic Party uh, beyond supporting black women, funding black women, what which is a big lesson. <laughs> is a, huge a lot of people lesson. don't even know that lesson. Right. But what do you think needs to happen for 2018 and, and 2020 for the progressive wing of the Democratic Party in particular? This is what I think. For average everyday citizens to look at, um, look at the multiracial coalition as the key to victory. Um, we publish a report called Return of the Majority and uh, on the Democracy in Color website and it really outlines, here are all the uh, congressional races that are winnable if we invest on on-the-ground operations. And people who have influence at their state party, people who have influence in their own community, can start to look at who we are as Democrats and as electorate much, uh, uh, in a much more full, um, much richer way. And part of it is believing that we actually have everything that we need to win if we invest in not spending millions on TV ads, not, not, um, not trying to convince the Trump voters, they've, they've already made how clear and, right. and dedicated they are to issues of racism. And they, they, they're, um, right they're now, now get, they're gone. But we have enough amongst us uh, to win. And um, we're, we're not defeated by that. We're actually, we have a path to victory um, and we must believe it ourselves. We must look to a new set of, of leaders and invest. So if you can send, you, um, Awesome Love You is a, is a blogger. She, she put up a whole database of, uh, I don't know, mm -hmm. almost 400 yep. black women running. Just go there, find somebody who's running and invest in one of them. That's a very practical thing we can do. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, thank Amy. You. We'll be back soon with more from El Barrio Firehouse Studio. I'm Christina Greer, and you're watching a joint production of Free Speech TV and the Manhattan Neighborhood Network. I really appreciate it. Thank Thanks you. so much. Welcome back. We're discussing the best path forward for progressives going into the crucial midterm elections in November with Amy Allison, Zephyr Teachout, and Dan Cantor. How can progressives push and prod the Democrats in a better direction? Dan, I'm going to start with you. Based on our previous conversation that I just had with Amy, does the Working Families Party, or do you think progressive Democrats, do they have what we might call in the 21st century a race problem? Yes, and this is America, uh, and you know that was our original sin, as the saying has it. 
Um, doesn't mean it's intractable, doesn't mean, but it does mean you have to focus on it and focus on it and stay, stay at it and look to the leadership of black progressives especially. Uh, I'm a big believer in the need for a black left to really uh, be strong. Um, so that's on everybody's mind. Uh, in this moment, things like Stacey Abrams' race in Georgia that Amy was talking about, Working Families Party has already endorsed her. Every progressive in the country should check out this, this race mm -hmm. uh, and invest in it. Uh, it's not the only one, but we need to win both some high profile, that's gonna be the marquee race uh, in the South, Ben Jealous's race for governor of Maryland. Which uh, I might argue is the South. <laughs> yeah, th there's a good reason for that. Um, at the same time, I would, uh, I would rotate at just a few degrees what Amy was talking about, uh, building on the new American majority in statewide races. We also have to think about some of the district races. History of segregation makes it harder for that strategy to win the state legislative races that we also need to win. We need to win statewide. We also need to flip these chambers. So we have to figure out how do we animate kind of the uh, younger of color voters? How do we pull back some number of white working class voters who have been disdained uh, by the Democrats? And how do we move these white women that clearly moved alongside black women, uh, for example, in the Alabama race? So, you know, there's never one, one thing only that you have to do in politics. You gotta do a lot of different things. But this is a moment to build on kind of the energy that the Movement for Black Lives has demonstrated, that Occupy, that the, day that the immigrant rights movement, even the People's Climate March, and combine these social movements with kind of electoral, grinded out strategies that can yank, willing or unwilling, yank the Democratic Party into the future, into a progressive future. Amy and Zephyr, before I get you two in here, I want to just ask, what is the black left? Do, does the black left operate separately from the progressive movement, or will it have a role in leadership within the progressive movement? Wh Both. Where does it situate yeah, I mean, itself, uh, and how do you define it? So everybody has their own definition. Uh, the, in some measure, the American history is about the struggle for uh, the black freedom struggle, you know, from, from after the revolution through, until through abolition to the Civil War, and then Reconstruction, Jim Crow, lynching, civil rights, right? This is the motor of American democracy. Um, and it's gonna continue to be that. Now it's even more complicated. It's not just a black and white country. It's a multiracial, multi, you know, people of color uh, world, uh, as well as plenty of white people. Nearly 70% of voters are white still. So we have to figure out how to unite people behind a certain set of ideals and values, realize that we, we actually all do better, as Paul Wellstone said, uh, we all do better when we all do better. And so that requires not just lip service towards communities of color, it involves really understanding the history. We gotta stop lying to ourselves. To me, that's the great contribution that Black Lives made. They pulled away the, ca the curtain and we're not lying about our own history. That said, Nobody can do it by themselves. We have to figure out what are the issues that are gonna take people forward jointly. Amy, do you have a sort of response to What's the black left? <laughs> I, I think I'm in it. Right. Yeah. I don't even <laughs> think about that. Uh, it's a new kind of politics. It's intersectional. Um, it's multiracial. I mean, um, it is true that the black freedom struggle uh, for 400 years has been an underpinning. I mean, shoot, even, even the, the, the Voting Rights Act came at the same time the Immigration and Naturalization Act that opened up uh, immigration to non-white countries that helped to uh, change the very uh, face of, the, of this country, and that's all connected. Uh, but it's intersectional. It's, um, it's, uh, uh, it really can be understood as um, a movement that's broad-based, that is, uh, uh, takes gender, and uh, takes ability, it takes LGBT issues in with race. Here, here's the thing, the majority of white, uh, the majority of voters are white, but the majority of white voters are Republican or vote, uh, vote for uh, supported Trump, and that's men and women. That's a reality that I find in my conversations with many white progressives have a hard time uh, understanding. If I talk to white women, they say, well, it's, the, it's evangelicals, or it's the Southern people, or it's the married women. Or what I really, really need is for us to have honest conversations amongst ourselves about who we are and who shows up. And so we're not defining like black left or white left. We actually need to uh, have a uh, real understanding and embracing the new American majority that we work in um, coalition across race and with and we elevate those who are most likely to show up. That's why my focus on, on women of color and the new American majority. 
the reason why there aren't more, um, and we look at a, a state like Texas, uh, a Trump won that state, it's a very important state in 2018. Um, there are a million, more than a million, um, unregistered uh, Latinos, and Latinos have proven to be, as a population, uh, strong Democrats. If you talk to them, you register and you engage them. And we figure we can't do everything. Like we can't, like I don't recommend going after Trump voters, we don't need them to win. But we do need a percentage of progressive whites and voters of color engaged in the process in order to win. So in a place like Texas, with an investment of 75 million, for example, you could have an on the ground operation that could win Alabama style. So why do I say that? Because we just went through 2016 election with, with Clinton, where um, there was nearly three billion raised and spent. And the money that was spent gets prioritized, and there's a consultant class who doesn't understand the new American majority that makes a ton of money, but loses consistently because they're based on an old playbook. And what I'm saying is we gotta have a new playbook that is uh, not only recognizes those who are the uh, strongest progressives and invest them, but also um, uh, looks at the places that are coming up and invest properly in those districts and in those states. So we can win Maryland. There's enough black voters in Maryland to win a primary already. There's um, enough black voters in, um, in Florida to win a Democratic primary. Those are two places where those are ultimately winnable, where David Garcia is running for governor in um, Arizona with, with a very strong on the ground um, uh, voter engagement effort that's fully funded, we can win that. In California, and there are seven states of the majority of people of color, uh, those seven uh, congressional seats that are Republican, that sit on um, uh, districts that Clinton won, those are majority people of color districts, those can be won. So I need, uh, I need to have a different kind of conversation amongst progressives to understand the path to victory. We have a path to victory, it's clear. Yeah, so Zephyr, I, I saw a sign from the Women's March uh, last weekend that said, uh, feminism without intersectionality is white supremacy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was yeah. pretty powerful. So as a progressive, mm -hmm. as yeah. a leader of the progressive movement, and also as a candidate, twice, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Where do you see sort of progressive candidates? You know, you've, yeah. you ran sort of in, in upstate New York, which mm -hmm. I don't think the congressional district was terribly uh, racially diverse, but you know, you did run in a very diverse state, in New York yes. State. Yeah. So what would your response be to, to Dan and Amy about you know, pulling in a more multiracial, centering sort of women, women of color as leadership in the progressive movement um, in this kind of Bernie bro era? So one, it's absolutely necessary. Like we are not winning. Uh, nobody, uh, I completely agree with uh, what my colleagues here have said that, that um, progressives need to be engaging absolutely, not just targeting in terms of get out the vote, but targeting in terms of our policies, policies that uh, will engage um, black women, men and women across the board, all of that, all of that is absolutely essential. But to do that, we gotta be honest about some of the causes. <laughs> okay, so one of the big causes for um, uh, why you don't see more uh, women of color running and women in general running. Um, I like to say dark money is white men, um, is that since Citizens United, we've had a money in politics problem for a long time, mm -hmm. um, but since Citizens United, it's gotten a lot worse. And the money that is flowing into politics from big corporations um, and from big donors is overwhelmingly um, incredibly powerful white men um, who are completely uninterested in the real uh, issues of race in our country. So we want to need to be honest about the way money in politics interacts with who candidates are, how campaigns are formed, who gets jobs on campaigns, all of those things are really important. The other thing I want to um, uh, sort of pay attention to is this, these, these sort of big money uh, hedge fund managers, and uh, they're not playing. <laughs> they're really trying to take over and rip the soul out of our country in a lot of ways. So even in states where Democrats win, you see, and I'm, I'll use New York, because mm -hmm. I know New York the best. Um, in New York, overwhelmingly Democratic state. The leader of the Senate should be 
an African-American woman, Andrea Stewart Cousins, Senator Andrea Stewart Cousins. She is the minority leader instead of the majority leader mm -hmm. because big real estate and hedge fund money has swooped in and convinced eight elected Democrats to support Republican leadership and sidelined her. And in fact, one of the big donors said that she is worse than the KKK, an unbelievably racist statement, um, because she supports public schools instead of supporting the privatization and charterization of schools. So there's a lot of, I, I know I'm throwing a lot of balls in here, in, into the, but I think we need to be really honest about all the ways in which um, big money actually leverages racism and divides us. If you look at North Carolina, you'll see that ALEC, which actually pushed for voter suppression, this is the um, uh, corporate front group, is fun was funded, thanks to protests no longer, by, by Google, by JP Morgan. So these are big companies leveraging, basically saying, hey, we want to have Republican leadership because it's better for our tax base. So we're okay supporting um, racist leaders to suppress the vote. We're okay leveraging racism and encouraging racism as long as we get a good tax deal. So I actually think it's really important that we see the relationship between corporate power and race. And these are, there's a dynamic interaction. It's not just passive. So what happens when you have Democrats, though, behaving, I guess, as Republicans with corporate power? We've seen plenty of elected sure. Democrats do the same thing. New York currently has a Democratic governor who is sanctioning this behavior, who is in bed with many of these And these we have the most segregated interests. schools in the country, in New York City, under a Democratic governor. So, so Amy and then, and then yeah. Dan. Yeah, I was, you know, one thing that we are sorely missing is a sense of what is it that is our platform? Um, and, you know, the, the Democratic Party in a two-party system is such a huge tent that um, what we progressives stand for, I mean, a lot of it I look at, like the Women's March, for example, when we talk about intersectional politics and a, and a policy agenda, we need to be, you know, talking about and holding um, our candidates and our elected officials to that standard. What is it that we are trying to do? And also the measure of the courage that when the votes that count. I talked about DACA, but there's a lot of votes um, that come right down to the line. And when, when it comes to people over profits, um, when the Democrats are voting in a particular way, it's very upsetting. And the sense of powerlessness, we work hard to get someone into office, we believe in them, and then they demonstrate that they aren't worth, <laughs> um, wasn't worth our energy because the, the difference wasn't a huge difference in terms of having their representation. So uh, we have to get clear about um, not playing this sort of there's a there's a thing that on, uh, that progresses we, we could we can do which is to say this is the best we can do right now let's uh, let's play this this you know we'll trade this card for that card some people may say that that's what uh, politics is but this is a different age this is the age of Trump this is an age where uh, we whenever there's a pro whenever they vote on something real people are hurt it's a, it's an age yeah. where white supremacists are feeling emboldened that they're uh, as we heard from Senator Cory Booker, they are the big uh, domestic threat. They are the terrorist threat in our country. We see the Im immigration votes where they're rounding people up, um, sweeping, they came to California, they're uh, coming into our sanctuary state and, and doing sweeps of 7-Elevens and other places. It is a very serious time. So we, it's not the kind of game where we say, oh, next time around, we'll try it. We are at a point where our leadership must be bold in the defense of, of, the, of, of, of regular people. And, uh, and uh, part of that is being clear about what it is we're fighting for and holding a high standard. It's not a time to go soft. It's time to go. It's a time to go harder in right. terms of what we need to happen in this country. And do you, Dan, do you think that the Working Families Party needs to fundamentally uh, rethink their strategy in the era of Trump or can you all still operate in the insider outsider status and sometimes going with you know say the Andrew Cuomo's of the world uh, <laughs> in so 2018? I, I think um, politics is hard uh, Heather McGee Heather, Tell us more, <laughs> Heather, McGee, Heather McGee of Demos has this line about how uh, strategic racism or weaponized racism mm -hmm. has been used for uh, a very long time to sort of uh, distract and and uh, and divide uh, and keep uh, you know a ruling class in charge, um, 
there is no way to undo that without having the honest conversations about it, right? We have to be able to talk to, it's not just the job of black people to talk about racism. Uh, it's, it's the job of everybody. Uh, economic inequality, the kind of the, the, the coarse inequality that defines America today, that somebody like me who comes out of an older left tradition is like focused on, is built on a scaffolding of racial inequality. Uh, another line stolen from, um, from McGee. But in any case, um, I think the strategy of the party is still the right one. That is to say, we need to do both the intellectual work and the organizing work and the candidate recruitment and training and the volunteer coordination and all the things th that take our ideas into the real moment of politics, which is the electoral moment. That's when most people are paying attention. And we have to show them that their votes actually matter by getting people elected who then govern in the way that we want them to govern, the point you were making about how do you hold people accountable. It d you don't just elect someone and leave them alone, right? You have to, uh, you, can't d you can't demand accountability down if you don't provide support up. It is very hard to be a good elected official. The minute you're elected, the Chamber of Commerce has their arm around you. We didn't support you, but we can help you now. So we have to be there providing the outside support and the outside uh, lever that keeps them true to the principles that they ran on. And we'll make mistakes. And we have to have, you know, we should have uh, open hearts here and realize that we're going to make mistakes, but still believe that we can make things better for people. Well, I appreciate you all coming in so much as we think about the scaffolding of progressive politics and the, the structural racism that unfortunately is built into not just the country, but how we organize ourselves. Uh, we're just about out of time, so please join me in thanking our guests on this joint production of Free Speech TV and the Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Thank you, Amy Allison, for highlighting the particular crucial role of women of color in the Democratic Party. Thank you, Zephyr Teachout, for having the courage to run against the Democratic establishment and for continuing to speak out. And thank you, Dan Cantor, for your past work organizing for working families and present work recruiting, training, and electing the next generation of progressive leaders. From the Manhattan Neighborhood Network Studios at El Barrio Firehouse in East Harlem, New York, I'm Christina Greer. Thank you for watching. Thank you.